Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our three topics today are two related to Apple, other core businesses doing, and then separately we're going to talk about just everything AI and what's going on there. And then we'll talk about what's going on with Tesla and FSD in China. And so going back to the top, shares of Apple up about 6% following their March results. Uh, after the company had reported, the stock was up just before their earnings call around 7%. So it's been kind of holding those gains here. And I believe that the main reason why the stock is up is that the June quarter guidance was unchanged. Most people, present company included, expected them to guide down. I was thinking that they would bring June to flat year over year from last year. Uh, the street was looking for up a percent and a half. I heard some investors talking about the business being down 2% in June. And so there's a relief rally related to the June guidance. And I think it speaks to just the strength of Apple's products, in part because China has shown improvement. still down. I think down 8% versus 13% in the previous quarter. But just the the collective, what's going on with the iPhone on top of that services up 14% uh, show that the business is holding together, again, up to be uh, projected to be up a couple percent in the June quarter. The piece that I uh, kind of goes beyond the importance of everything holding together for the June quarter is that the revenue growth for the back half of the year should continue to improve and does meet the criteria of an acceleration. And so in the to put some perspective, in the just reported March quarter, revenue is down about 4%. As I mentioned, it'll be up about 2% in June, and then probably 4 and 6% for the back half of the year. And you put that together, that back half of the year, up around 3-ish percent. That's very different than what's happened over the last eight quarters when the business has been on average down 0.3%. And so uh, this growth is starting to return. Um, it is worth mentioning just over the past couple of years, Apple has a particular has had a particular large FX headwind. Generally, Doug and I, we don't like talking about FX because sometimes it's a positive and sometimes it's a negative. So just kind of it's a wash. But one thing that is unique about Apple is 60% of their revenue does come from outside of the U.S., and so uh, I think that that has had a little bit of a headwind relative to the past couple of years. So uh, let's keep it simple. The business has been flat. Now we're getting to re-acceleration. There's been some commentary that the stock is up because of the increased buyback. And I just want to give some quick perspective on that. I think it plays a little bit into why the stock is up. Uh, the expectations with that they're going to increase it by $90 billion. The They did $110 billion. And I think that it is testimony to this, how much cash this business is generating. They're at net cash right now. Uh, this is their debt minus their cash is $57 billion. They want to get to zero. They've talked about that for many years. And I think that they are increasing the buyback in part to try to get there faster, get to zero faster, net, ca net cash uh, neutral faster. And uh, CFO Luca on the call said that even with this bigger buyback, the business is just so strong that they will not get to net cash neutral anytime soon. And so that was another big takeaway is that even with revenue growth being flattish, they're still generating a ton of cash. And uh, it just feels like the business is holding together uh, nicely. Services again up 14%. China had that slight improvement and it, it's not uh, spectacular, but it's holding together. I think that it was a sigh of relief. Everything you just said, Gene, about business not being as bad as maybe investors feared, buybacks really strong. I also think none of it really matters for the stock when we think about it for the next two, three, five years. I think the I next agree. two, three, five years for Apple is going to be highly dependent on what they ultimately do in AI. And that's our second topic. I think, I think that's the thing uh, that everybody is still paying attention to and still wondering about. Doug, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, do you know what Tim Cook and his prepared remarks, his first comment was related to on the call? I think he referenced the Vision Pro first, and then he mentioned generative AI second, I think. So in order, I'm going to go in reverse order here. Generative AI was number four. Vision Pro three. Services number two, up 14%. Number one, Indonesia. 
record levels. So to, 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 to run it in the proper order, Indonesian services were number one and two. I think it does speak to just how they want to kind of shift the investor narrative here, really focus on some of those higher growth areas and kind of some of the, the durability of services. Before we jump in and talk more about AI, I will mention that I was surprised at how often they talked about Vision Pro. It was uh, the third topic. Uh, Cook mentioned that I think it was half the Fortune. I thought he said Fortune 100 companies uh, are, are, are uh, 80% of them are testing Vision Pro, which is encouraging. That also speaks to, at this point, the consumer really isn't anywhere to be found when it comes to Vision Pro. I think we have uh, have well uh, discussed that, and it still comes down to these apps that need to get built. I'm still a believer on Vision Pro. Apple still... Uh, uh, holding to their belief that this is going to uh, play forward. Uh, I, if I can speak for you, Doug, you're in the camp that this is uh, gr- incredible technology, but probably isn't going to be a mainstream product. Correct. And I, again, I would put it in the context of AI, Vision Pro, spatial computing. You know, it's a it's a five or ten on a scale of a hundred, where AI is ninety nine. And I think Apple needs to realize those priorities. I think investors are rightfully, uh, some investors at least, rightfully say, why invest all this money in Vision Pro when you could be spending it on creating incredible AI products? Because those are going to be the things that really drive the business for the next decade. Fair. And I'm at a 20, by the way, on a scale of 1 to 100. And we've got like the Mac and the PC at a 20, iPhones like at a 50 and and AI close to 100. So let's shift to AI here. Of course, our attention was on that. About half the questions on the call had something to do with AI. They hit it hard at the top of the call. Uh, Cook said at the top that they're going to leverage hardware, software services to make better AI products. And my reaction to that is, of course, that makes sense. They're going to do that. He also mentioned that privacy is one of their competitive advantages. And this is something that you and I have talked about related to Apple. It is. I think to some extent, uh, I, I generally play the skeptic here. Um, I don't know how much consumers really care about privacy. Is Apple, you know, the best or do they brand themselves the most around privacy? Yes. I don't see people leaving Meta or Google or these other services in droves and saying, I don't want those companies to have my data. And the reality is those companies, Google and Meta, are really the ones that are driving AI forward, we really don't know what Apple's doing yet with AI. And I don't know that the privacy angle is really going to matter all that much in that context. Yeah, there is that debate. You've talked in the past about we're in a post-privacy world. I think that uh, younger people under 30 are in that post-privacy world. I'm 53. I'm in a privacy matters world. And so I think- uh, But you still use Google. You still use I Google. do, but I think my willingness to give, if you just say you have your all of your consumer, let's say your uh, data around purchase data, and I can give it to Google to help better train my uh, personal AI agent, or I can give it to Apple, I'm going to give it to Apple nine out of nine times. I think you give it to both. I, I don't think I, you would say no to one. I think, you'd, uh, I think you'd give it to both. Uh, yeah, I, for, but for me, I would opt to give it to Apple. And no, you would give uh, it to both. You wouldn't give it to both. You would say only Apple could have that data. I'm confused. By yeah, that. I, I, I do. I do not like sharing my purchase data. I like, for example, that uh, Apple, when I make a transaction with uh, tap and pay, that it scrambles the, some of the details of that transaction. So I'm, I'm old. I um, agree. I'm old, but I think that this is, this is going to appeal. The privacy piece will appeal to a segment. It may be a small segment. Uh, it's definitely not everybody. I agree, under 30 or post-privacy, but I still think that there is a, a, a sizable market that cares about uh, privacy. But we'll, we'll keep moving forward because I think that the uh, kind of the substance of this is what are we predicting they're going to say in June? And what does that mean for where they're going for this down the road? It's hard to say what they're going to say in June. I feel like every week we get a different report and, you know, they're thinking about partnering with Google. They're thinking about partnering with OpenAI. It certainly seems that they're going to have to partner with somebody. 
because I don't know that they uh, have made enough progress to have their own model at this point. And something that we've been talking about is the reality with these foundation models, these, these models that I think are um, approaching general intelligence. So models that can do everything, not models that are narrow intelligences that do one thing really well. There'll be many of those. But these foundation models, really, you look at the landscape, it's OpenAI, it's Google with Gemini, it's Meta with Llama. Maybe we see XAI and uh, Grok built on X data and maybe even some of the other data from Elon's companies. Those are the ones that seem to have the most unique data. Apple has a ton of data, but I don't think they have a ton of data that's that relevant to build a competitive large language model. So first mm -hmm. thing I'm curious to see at WWDC is, do they announce a partnership? Do we finally learn who that they uh, who they are going to work with? Mm -hmm. And then second is, how much are they going to do on their own? Is it going to be some of the on-device stuff, or are they maybe even going to partner with the third party to do a lot of the onboard on-device stuff? Quickly on that topic is, I, that was my biggest takeaway from the AI conversation is Luca's comments saying that when it comes to data centers, they want to do some of it themselves and they want to work with third parties. And the third parties in this case would be Google or Microsoft. And so I felt like they all but announced they're going to be leveraging someone else's foundation model. They may have their own model that they use periodically, but that was a, a little bit of a disappointment for me. I wish they would have gone heavy into, we're going to build infrastructure. We're going to have our own model. Uh, maybe it's the right decision for them to 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 partner, but I think that uh, it felt like the probability of that outcome, like you said, increased uh, measurably. Uh, I'll just one more thought on what I'm expecting. I think that it's going to be pretty light what we're going to see this year when it comes to AI and Apple. Maybe some branding around the next iPhone that's an AI phone, some features in the next iOS and Mac OS that will do some things that uh, I think Windows did a year or so ago. And down the road, this personalized agent, agentic AI, call it what you like, I think is on their, their roadmap. So I'm keeping a close eye on the clock here, Doug. We don't want to shortchange what started out the week with a bang, which was Elon going to, uh, Elon going to China, uh, getting like preliminary approval for FSD in China. Mm. Shares of Tesla were up 18% on that news. What was your reaction? Surprising, I think, uh, that China would give, particularly given how the relations have been between China and the U.S., that China would give uh, right such after a, TikTok too, like right. I mean, the timing was crazy. Who could have predicted that? Um, but give an American company um, this this clearance. I mean, obviously, Baidu has been operating uh, Apollo, its autonomous service in Wuhan for uh, a long period of time. Now they have a lot of data, including a lot of data with uh, driver uh, less complete. So no uh, safety driver in the car. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was, was pretty surprising. And as we think about this opportunity around robo taxis, the thing that we've been talking a lot about is I mean, ultimately, the government is probably a bigger roadblock than the technology itself in the next three, five years. Um, and so to get a government approval, even right. if it's not in the U.S., we're talking about overseas, that's, that's a big deal. And it's, China's a big market, too. About a third of EV sales are in China. So I would have uh, lost a dollar if I put a bet on how that played out. And I think it does speak to maybe we're getting closer to FSD. We're going to talk a lot more before August 8th in terms of our expectations on what to expect from that event, but definitely a, a, a nice, I uh, call this a leap forward for FSD. They're not approved yet, but still a leap forward. On behalf of Doug and Gene and this episode of Deep Tech 315, bye for now.